those were the only ones that were published. So wouldn't that be the new current? Ah, system? wait, hold on. There is a different kind of null hypothesis. Null hypothesis in the sense <clears throat> that, let's say, for example, suppose in the 19th century somebody wanted evidence to show that Newton is right. Well, there is there was so much evidence that Newton was right. Now, to some, for somebody to start a writing a research paper saying that Newton was right, people are going to ask, well, that is already well established. Why do you want to prove that? Unless there is something more interesting, that is, there is further evidence for Newton in some other domain that nobody has looked at. That's what that, that will become the null hypothesis. Okay, the null hypothesis, for example, if I if I drop this, it'll fall. If I do this experiment of dropping this 10,000 times and showing you that it is going to fall in a straight line, people are going to ask, why do you want to waste your time? Right? But if it turns out that there are situations in which if I drop this, it will stay there or it will go sideways, that should be interesting. That is unexpected. So it is the unexpected states of affairs that you want to prove. <clears throat> Something that is obviously true, you don't again go ahead and you know, prove it again. I don't really get the concept of what's obviously true. What we take as obviously true. So, for example, in the case of correlations, we know that the null hypothesis is if there is variable x and variable y, the null hypothesis is there is no correlation. So, with, uh, the correlation, alleged correlation between length of nose and intelligence, the null hypothesis is no correlation. So uh, two kinds of null hypothesis. One kind says, unless you show that there is a regularity, it is random. That's a null hypothesis. Right? The other is, if there is something that is already established and it's fairly firm, that becomes the null hypothesis. So we have seen things falling down in a straight line so many times that another research paper showing that it will fall down in a straight line is not. <coughs> is not worth this sort. So two kinds of null hypothesis. Okay, I'll, we'll come back to the null hypothesis maybe <coughs> when we go to observation inquiry in some detail. Uh, what I want to do now is to begin at the, <coughs> at the very basics. <coughs> I'm going to repeat something that I said in the first session, I think. Uh, and then pick up one of the components in some detail. So in the first session, I said that research has the following components. Any research begins with the research question. There is something that you want to find out. Something that you don't know, but you would like to find out. An articulation of that is your research question. This is a very simple statement, but in the majority of cases, when people send research proposals, they have a topic, they don't have a research question. So you have to ask them, what is your research question? They have no idea. Okay, this unfortunately this is a state of affairs with <coughs> thesis proposals when people come and talk to you. I want to do research, and you ask, what do you want to work on? They give you some broad area and say, yeah, yeah. What is your question? And they say, what's the question? <laughs> okay, so <coughs> this is one. Once you have a research question, then you have to have a way of looking for an answer, and that we call methodology. Methodology is a strategy to look for an answer to a question. <coughs> Once you have selected your methodology, and you have implemented the methodology, then you have an answer to your question <coughs> through the methodology. Methodology has to be appropriate for your research question. And from the answer, you arrive at a conclusion. These elements may not be present in every uh, every piece of research. For example, in some cases, the answer is a conclusion, not a separate thing. 
but it is a good idea to uh, restate the answer still as a conclusion. If it is a conclusion, then you have to show <clears throat> that it follows from something, that the conclusion is rationally justified. That is where the justification component comes in. Uh, what does justification mean? People use other words like proof, evidence, uh, and so on. Uh, people say backup, support, etc. So you have to show that the conclusion that you have arrived at is rationally justified, and this is how you you convince your colleagues, convince the research community that your conclusion must be accepted. <clears throat> so just as, for example, the prosecution lawyer provides an argument to show that the uh, accused is guilty, researchers give evidence, reasoning, argumentation, etc., to show that the conclusion that they want to support has to be accepted. The reasons for accepting the conclusion. We will look at most of these things. I'm just giving an abstract, rough idea. <clears throat> um, justification is what the writer, the researcher, offers in defense of his conclusion. What about the community? What about the others? They are skeptical of the conclusion advanced. So they engage with the justification, conclusion, justification. They apply critical thinking. <clears throat> they critically evaluate the conclusion and ask, should we accept it? They also evaluate the justification. So this is from the point of view of the research, the researcher writer, and this is from the point of view of the reader. Yeah. Sir, isn't uh, the justification somewhat a part of the methodology? In, in certain, case, ca certain cases, it is built into the methodology itself. So for example, a great deal of experimental research builds the objections that your readers are going to ask into the methodology. So for instance, when you, <coughs> we'll discuss this later, but let me simply say, part of the experimental research methodology is what is called control of extraneous variables. That has to be built into your methodology. This is anticipating objections. And if the methodology is right, all the objections are already taken care of. In theoretical research, it is not built into the methodology. So what the researcher does is to entertain alternative conclusions and show that the other conclusions are false. So that, that is built into here. So whether it is here or here doesn't matter. It's still part of ways of convincing a skeptical reader that the conclusion is correct. That is what justification is. When somebody asks you, why should I believe you? Your answer is justification. <clears throat> um, after all this is done, you have communication. You have to communicate all this stuff to your fellow researchers. And there is also reading. Reading, listening, etc. After all, to, to engage in research, you have to read something. But I put that at the very end because um, I will be concerned with some of these things, not this part. I, we may touch upon the communication part and the reading part mildly, but not uh, in great detail because there are many subject specific aspects in that which um, you will have to pick up when you do actual research in a specific, uh, on a specific project. I am concerned with the aspects of research that cut across disciplinary boundaries. So whether it is physics or biology or medicine or mathematics, doesn't matter. These aspects come up again and again. <coughs> okay. Now, this is what we'll be doing in this course. How do you find questions? What kind of methodology do you use? What are the considerations that you have to uh, take care of when you have when you have chosen a methodology, etc., etc. How do you prove something? These are the kinds of things that we need to take care of. Of all these, the most difficult is actually finding a good research question. 
Okay. If you have a good research question, it is formulated, 50% of your job is done for you. Most people have difficulty because if they don't have a research question, or in some cases they have a research question, but they haven't formulated it right. As a, as a thesis advisor, in fact, I find that uh, this is where I have to pay maximum attention to. And sometimes what happens is in, in theoretical research at least, the question becomes clear only towards the end of research, only after you have written the first draft of your thesis. That, doesn't, that cannot happen in experimental research. There's a huge difference between the two. So my wife did her PhD in Stanford, and there's a general convention that two years before you do, you start writing your PhD thesis, uh, you have to do a research proposal. And people come and listen, ask you questions and so on, and they'll say, yes, okay, now you can proceed to do your research. Until then you do your coursework. First two years, you do your coursework, and then you submit a research proposal, you defend it, and only, only then can you be registered for a PhD. This is the North American system, not the European system. <coughs> Uh, and at the end of two years, she was asked to submit a research proposal, and she said, how do I know what I'm going to say until I you know, write it? And she refused to submit a research proposal. After a while, people just forgot about it. And then she wrote her thesis, defended it, and everything was okay, people went and congratulated her. And somebody in the administration discovered that she hadn't done her thesis proposal. So she couldn't technically be awarded a PhD. So they called her up and said, hey, you haven't done your thesis proposal, your proposal defense, so let's do that. And so she did her defense of the thesis proposal after she defended her thesis, and it became a huge joke. And then, of course, the Stanford department said, this cannot happen again. And so they made, made very sure that all students defended their proposal before they submitted the thesis. Um, this, this is, but what happens is typically you make one proposal and your thesis will go in a completely different direction. In, in theoretical research, that can happen quite often. Experimental research, that would be costly. If you change your topic, change your research question in the course of doing it, all the money that you have to get for your experiment will <laughs> be wasted. So this is one difference between theoretical research and experimental research. <coughs> Okay, so this is an extremely difficult question. I mean, difficult issue. How to find the research question? How do you formulate it? Etc. But there are certain strategies that you can use for this. <clears throat> now, the way you discover a research question depends upon the kind of research that you want to do. Okay, um, and broadly speaking you might say there are four kinds of research. Okay. One of them is, uh, <coughs> no, let, let me say, let me step back. Let me just distinguish three kinds of research. One kind of research is there is a hypothesis testing model. This is what we do in science, and corresponding to that is in mathematics, that is conjecture proving research. Hypothesis testing, the research question is formulated as, here's a, here's a proposition, and you ask, here's a claim that you're making that such and such thing is true. And you ask the question, is this true? And the answer can be, yes, it is true, or no, it cannot be true, or it is not true. So uh, I have a hypothesis that uh, <clears throat> if you have hiccups, you can cure hiccups by taking a glass of water and bending down, drinking the water from this side of the cup, like this, and if you drink a few gulps, then your hiccups will subside, right? So this particular treatment will cure hiccups. Anybody tried that? Okay, so what you do is you do an experiment. Here, of course, the difficulty would be, how do you do a control experiment? 
hiccups come randomly. You cannot uh, go to a laboratory, get a thousand, thousand uh, subjects and say, okay, now hiccup. You can't hiccup like that. <coughs> so what you have to do is to ask a large number of people, for example, people like you, and whenever you have a hiccup, try doing it and come back and report to me, and then you can say, out of the 100 people I asked, 99 reported that uh, it cured the hiccup, and one, one of them reported that it didn't. Okay. No, so that's a hypothesis testing case. The hypothesis is that this particular procedure that I outlined will cure hiccups. Pardon me? Control. No, control in this case, you cannot do control because you cannot artificially, you can't have a group of people who, that you ask to have hiccups. You are, if, okay, let me put it this way. Why? Suppose, suppose you get a thousand people, divide them into 500 and 500, and you get them to have hiccups, all of them, and <laughs> in one group, you ask them to do this, in another group, you ask them to do this. Okay, and you discover that people who do this never get their hiccups cured, but the people who do drink water like that, they cure their hiccup. Then, of course, there's an experimental group and a control group. That's a normal tradition, but you can't do that with hiccups. No, no, like just telling him not to do anything and if it stops by itself, then doesn't it uh, go against something? <coughs> well, you, there, there, are, there are problems. You can't say not to do anything. You have to ask them to do something. Because the belief there is a double blind experiment problem. I'll explain all this case a little later. Um, remind me someday, uh, ask me what is a double blind experiment? Um, I'm, so I'm going to sidestep that thing a little bit because I want to um, pursue this. So this is a problem that I see in all my teaching because I want students to take charge of the direction of the course. I don't want to come with a pre-prepared lecture and deliver it and go away like a clockwork. That would be very well structured if I do that. So all that I have to do to do a very well structured lecture is to make sure that nobody asks me questions. Okay, but then I think if nobody asks me questions, it's a waste of time. If nobody asks me questions, nobody will learn anything either. Okay, so suppose in a group like this, people ask different questions. I plan to do something about this. I end up doing something very different. I have no control over where I'm going. One person drags me in that direction, another person drags me in that direction. At the end of it, you're going to see me wandering all over the place. That's the risk that uh, this style of teaching where you leave the control to students uh, is bound to happen. So I need to have a way of figuring out the right kind of balance between <coughs> structure and student control. I must confess that after 35, I don't know how long I've been teaching, like more, definitely more than 30, I still haven't figured out the right balance. And I probably will never will find out the right balance. For me? For what? <laughs> See, that, that could be possible. Okay. Vote. Do you want me to do double blind or do you want me to continue with this? <laughs> All right. <laughs> double blind. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> okay, um, before I do double blind, I have to do this notion of control, which is crucial in experiments. <clears throat> so let me take an example. Uh, <clears throat> suppose I say, here is a way of curing cold common cold. And if you if you have a common cold, in the morning, at noon, and at night, you chant uh, the ten names of Arjuna. You know the names like right? Arjuna, Parguna, Vartha, Kiriri, whatever. There are ten names for Arjuna. If you chant this ten times in the morning, 
in the, at noon and at night, you'll be cured. Okay, now <clears throat> what you do is you take a, a sample of, let us say, 1,000 people and you ask them to do this and you discover that, in, that all these people who chanted Arjuna, Arjuna Bhartana, they, their cold was cured in seven days. Right? And you publish your paper saying, this is a good remedy to cure common cold. What's wrong with this? Yeah. So it may be the case that if you don't sing, do this, the cold gets cured in four days. Right? When you do this, then it takes seven days. So how do you design an experiment such that you can really test it? What you have to do is to have two groups. One group in which they chant this stuff, and the other group that doesn't chant the stuff. Okay? So that is what control is. So you don't know why the, why the cold got cured. There may have been some other reason for doing it. That's the basic idea. In this particular case, the reason is the cold gets cured anyway, independently of your action. So you have to think of the possible other causes, alternative causes for the effect that you're observing, and then you have subjects that take care of you know, all these things. That is what control means. Now, the so-called double-blind experiment is specific to drug testing. So, uh, let's do this experiment all over again. Uh, you get two groups, and one group you ask uh, to do the chanting, the other group, they do nothing. And you discover that the people who did the chanting actually got better in three days, others got better in six days. Okay, does this mean that uh, you are, the cause is the right cause for curing cold? That it is the chanting of uh, ten names of Arjuna that cured your cold? You obviously think that's not right, but why do you think it's not right? No, you have two groups. In one group, out of 1,000 people, 500 people chanted and they got cured in three days. The other 500 did not chant and noted they took six days to get themselves cured. So doesn't it mean that chanting cures common cold? What are the other 500 people doing? Nothing. Yeah, the reason why this is not acceptable in drug testing is that the belief that something will cure, that is sufficient to cure it. Okay? So, no, no, it is not philosophical. There is huge research done on this. For example, if you give just plain sugar pills or ordinary pills to people saying this will cure you, in a large majority of cases it is faster healing. People also have uh, figure out what kinds of things will cure faster. For example, if you give a tablet versus a capsule, capsule cures faster. It doesn't have to have any medicine. Capsule is definitely faster. If you give an injection, it is even better than a capsule. I'm not, I'm not saying this in a flippant way. People have done these experiments. There is some difference between white tablets and blue tablets. I think blue works better. I'm not sure. One of them works better. Okay, these are completely irrelevant things. So it doesn't matter what the cure is. You can ask them to uh, chant Arjuna. You can ask them to charge, uh, chant Mohana. doesn't matter. Oh, that may not work out well. You have to have some God name. Uh, <laughs> pardon me? One? Mohana. Yeah, that is the kind of God's name. Yeah, but not as popular as you know, the regular names. Or you can ask them to you know, do this, whatever. So to ask them to do various things. And if they believe it, that will happen. So you have to have two different treatments for two different groups. One of them you have to ask to sing uh, Arjuna, and the other one you have to say sing Narendra Modi and uh, uh, all the all the prime ministers of India or something like that, uh, and see that. And if it shows that the person who chanted Arjuna 
gets cured faster, then that's possible evidence. But uh, when you prepare two conditions itself, wouldn't the other one be doing something else? Like, why can't you make them do that? No, they have to believe that there is a curing methodology, curing process that they are following. If they are doing nothing, there is no curing process. So there has to be a curing process. Something that they believe will cure them. If you do nothing, you are not cured. If you do nothing, you will say, okay, I'm not going to get cured. That's a belief. So this is one of the problems in testing homeopathic medicine. So how old is this belief that, uh, not belief, this, uh, I mean, from how long have they taken this into account? That, that even the belief that uh, you can be cured plays On the basis of just the belief. Yes. Um, at least 100 years. At least 100 years. In fact, this guy that I was referring to, Alfred Hoyle, had this idea, uh, even though I wasn't actually thinking about Hoyle, but it's very similar to the chanting thing. Hoyle had this idea that uh, if you pray for somebody, that person will get healed much faster than the person that you don't pray for. So about, I think about 20 years ago, I think, maybe even more, I'm not sure exact, exact, something like 20 years ago, he had a huge grant, something like several million dollars to test this up on, because because he was a well-known scientist, they gave him lots of money. And he asked, he did the control right. So he asked some people to um, not to be prayed for, others to be prayed for in various hospitals. And the people who were prayed for improved much, much more significantly than the people who were not prayed for. So I remember reading this stuff and saying, what? So the people, people who were being prayed for knew that they were being prayed for. And about five years later, the uh, US drug agency, the federal drug FDA, what is it called? Federal drug FDA. FDA. Yeah, FDA discovered this flaw in his research. They themselves did the same research again. This time, the patients did not know who were being played, uh, prayed for. No result. And if there was any correlation at all, it was a very mild negative correlation. Well, that's, but that, the negative correlation wasn't significant. So it's very important that the patient doesn't know what medicine the patient is getting. So this is one of the blinds. I said double blind, that is single blind. <clears throat> there is another problem. Yeah. Uh, one group that were not pay, uh, prayed for, and the other group which was prayed for. Huh. That was a control. No, no, they, huh. What were the patients told? Some, some patients were told, in Hoyle's experiment, some I patients were told that the they FDA, were being prayed for. In the FTA experiment? In the FTA experiment, they, they were told that some of you are being prayed for, others are not, but you don't know who. They had no idea who was being prayed for. So the patients did not know. They didn't have an idea of who was being prayed for. Yeah. They had an idea that some people were being prayed for. Yeah, that's it. I read something about this, but they were, they were told that there were three groups. Uh, first one was, for, uh, they weren't prayed for. Second one was prayed for, but they didn't know it. And third one was prayed for, and they were told. Yeah. And when they were told, they had yeah. negative. Yeah, that, that will do the same way. If you know that you are being prayed for, whether you are actually being prayed for or not, doesn't matter. In fact, there should be four groups. Then you will know the difference. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that will be a good, good experiment with all the four possibilities. So this is one blind. The other is the, uh, the researcher's bias. Okay. Suppose the doctors were looking at the patients, believe in the prayer hypothesis, then their judgment will be affected by that belief. Right? So patients come and the first patient uh, is prayed for and the doctor says, ah, this, this patient is much better. The second patient comes, the symptoms are exactly the same, but the doctor knows that this patient is not prayed for and the doctor will write, oh, sim uh, he hasn't been cured. So there's a bias, the experimenter's bias, 
the experimenter should not be the observer. So what they do is, the observer who judges the patient doesn't know who is being prayed for. That is also blind. Okay. So patient is blind and the observer is also blind. That is why it is called double blind. <clears throat> The patient doesn't know, but the observer knows. Yeah. Suppose I'm uh, designing an experiment to test whether uh, men are better drivers than women, right? And I, I, uh, but my test includes, for example, uh, I have this parking space like that, and you are supposed to re uh, reverse with a perfect right angle into this. And it has to be perfectly, not an angle, not a slanting way. And I get a man to do this, and he knows whether the people who are driving are men or women. And he's a sexist. What is he going to do? He is going to say, ah, the woman driver didn't you know, reverse well, or the men drivers reverse well. So the, the, the observers bias with people. The only way you can do that is for the person who is observing to not know whether the driver is a man or a woman. So you will ask the person to observe from, from top. You can't see the driver. Or the driver wears some kind of mask and <laughs> the person doesn't know. So there are all these complications, that the biases that get into research. And uh, double-blind experiments is one way of taking care of research in certain areas. <coughs> so I just wanted, uh, because we had yeah, just wanted your opinion on line trials uh, about surgical treatment. Surgical, yeah, the, you, can't, you can't do double blind on surgical treatments. Things like massage, surgery, etc. The patient will know, of course, right? No, sir, there have been like, uh, like, I think few decades back, they started doing such trials, but it wasn't, it was just single blind, of course. They would just leave an incision over patients and just... Yeah, yeah. You cut open the patient and say that your surgery has been performed. Another one, you cut open and do the actual surgery. That is no longer possible. There were many tests which were possible during Hitler's Germany. None of that is possible now. <clears throat> but in that, you cannot get a justification that the treatment works or not? For surgery? Yeah. No, surgery you have to try other things. Yeah, there are many other ways of taking care of these things. This is double blind experiments is not the only one. But when you have something like blood testing, that's an easy thing to do. But you can't do that for massage, for example. There are various complications of massage. You can't do that for teaching. Uh, because the students always know. A uh, complicated question because uh, many drugs show an immediate effect immediately, like for example, for a few weeks, and then after some time it disappears. Uh, there was a <clears throat> a guy who I don't know if he's still around in Hyderabad. There was a guy who would give fish to people uh, for asthma, and the, the style was they have to bring the fish from somewhere, small fish, and he puts some medicine in the mouth of the fish and puts it into the mouth of the patient, the patient swallows it. And thousands and thousands of people, he comes only once a year for this, and the whole place is full of asthma patients. In a large number of cases, asthma is cured. Okay. Uh, what people then reported was the curing of the asthma. About six months later, the asthma would come back. Or maybe not even six months. So my wife also went there, and he, she had a pretty big fish, and the guy put some stuff in, and uh, she was cured for some time, just for a few weeks actually, and then came back again. And then she was curious what was going on, and so they somehow, somehow they got the medicine. Some